Well, a few weeks back, Natalie took our youngest child, Jed, Jedediah, to the pediatrician for his one-year examination. It's hard to imagine that much time has already gone by, almost 14 months actually since he was born. And at the doctor's, Natalie was shocked that he had only grown five ounces going from his nine-month checkup to his 12-month checkup. I think that's the, the number of ounces. And so she started fretting why he wasn't growing. And before that, I think his typical pace was gaining a couple of pounds from each doctor's visit every two to three months. And as a parent, it's very easy to fret over the health of our children. And in that moment, I had to remind Natalie, it's okay. It could be because he started crawling since his last visit. It's not uncommon for babies to kind of plateau in their weight gain when they start to be more active. Let's wait a couple of months until his next appointment to see if his weight continues to stagnate. You know, it's, it's really not worth worrying at this point in time. And for the sake of conversation, though, what if two months from now, what if half a year from now, a year from now, Jed stays at the current weight? What if at two years old, he's still in army crawl mode on his tummy, scooting his arms, getting from point A to point B? What if at five years, he's not speaking in cognizant phrases, putting words together and and running around as you'd expect any young child to be doing? Then we'd have reasons for concern, wouldn't we? Now, let me be clear. I, I hope by this time next year, Jed will be doing all of that stuff. And I would join Natalie in significant concern if we don't see any of those benchmarks at that time. I mean, if Jed gets to Alicia's age, she's, she's four right now, and he's still like he is right now, crawling in and barely saying a word, we will need to be running tests with all sorts of different professionals to help us understand why. And why is that? Because we expect certain levels of growth at certain stages of life, don't we? We expect a human being to be able to do X, Y, and Z when he is or she is at a particular age. And if that child or that human being is not there yet, then there must be a reasonable explanation. Something must be preventing his growth. And that is to say, growth is expected. You can't remain a baby your whole life. Yes, different people have varying ranges of pace when it comes to growth. Some grow faster and others more slowly. But we all expect to grow, don't we? And if we don't, again, something is, is wrong. Again, can you imagine if my soon-to-be teenage son was speaking in Gugu Gaga language? You'd be scratching your head, wouldn't you? Moreover, expectation for growth isn't just in the physical realm. It should also be considered in the spiritual realm. We should be asking similar questions on the topic of spiritual maturity. Is it a problem, is it an issue if a person who professes faith in Jesus Christ is acting like a spiritual baby? Do you know of any professing Christians who seem to be stuck in a rut in the same cycle, lacking growth? Well, the truth is many Christians are in danger of remaining in spiritual infancy when they should be walking in a more mature manner. There are Christians who should be at a particular stage of of spiritual growth but are not yet there. And it was a problem in the first century church, and it's also a problem today. Well, if you haven't done so already, I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, towards the end of Hebrews chapter 5. It's our second Sunday back in Hebrews after a lengthy break, and we find ourselves in the midst of the heart of the sermon letter written by this unknown author, And he's going to present this robust argument on why Jesus' priesthood surpasses that of the Levitical priesthood. Remember last week how he touched upon the qualifications for Jesus to to serve as a high priest. Today, he's taking a break from talking about that, and he delivers a warning. It's the beginning portion of the warning that we'll look at and we'll continue on, Lord willing, into next week. 
You have to remember that the main message of Hebrews is don't fall away, cling to Jesus. Cling to Jesus because he's better than all of the institutions of the Old Testament. The people were in danger of departing from the faith. And part of the reason they were in danger of apostatizing or abandoning their newfound faith is because they did not have eyes to see the greatness of Jesus. Essentially, the author's warning in our section at the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter, beginning of chapter 6 is you're not where you should be when it comes to spiritual growth. You're not where you should be. Hebrews, you're tempted to revert back to Judaism because you failed to mature as much as someone in your place should mature. And his warning to them is, If they don't develop, if they don't grow, if they don't mature, if they don't cultivate their hearts for Christ, they will fall away from Christ. If they don't make progress forward, they will go backwards and ultimately to their demise. And the author seeks to light a fire under them to get them going. And it is a much needed word for the situation that they were facing. Their friends and and family, people they probably knew personally, were reverting back to the old religion that was comfortable and was, was easy for them because persecution for following Christ was heating up? Why follow Jesus if it's going to be so hard? And in light of that, in light of this truth, the, the author of Hebrews warns the people who haven't yet abandoned the faith, it's not too late for you. It's not too late for you. You can and you must press on in the faith. But, that's, but, but here's what's Part of the problem for you and the author lays it out. The author lays out the problem because he cares about him. He wants them to make it to the end with their faith intact. It may not be easy for them to hear. These words are kind of like a, a kick in the pants. You know, we're used to something a little more easy, something a little more palatable. But these words are kind of like a, a kick in the pants to get them going. And he's, he's straight to the point without beating around the bush. You're not where you should be, Hebrews. That's his message. And if I, could sum up, if I could sum it up in two words, it's an admonition to grow up. It's an admonition to, to grow up. The author of Hebrews strongly prods his audience and, and us even to mature, to progress in spiritual maturity. His tone is, is not soft, it's strong. It's like a, a buck up call to get up and get growing. And so in order to look at this grow up call, let's consider in two ways this passage. One, a diagnosis of the problem, and then number two, the directive to solve the problem. So number one, diagnosis, and number two, the directive. Getting right to the point for this diagnosis, the author of the sermon letter indicates that these Hebrew Christians are immature. Look at verse 11. About this, we have much to say. And that, that this is, going back, is on Melchizedek and the priesthood. So about this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. He's ready to talk about Melchizedek. That's what he means when he says he has much to say, but they are not ready. He wants them to be ready, but again, they're not. They're they're dull of hearing. Now, what is he getting at with this phrase, dull of hearing? It has to do with motivation. The word for dull, which is the same word you'll find in chapter 6, verse 12, so that's kind of like hinting at a a bookend, like a a section of the beginning and the end. That word conveys the idea of, of lethargy or laziness. It's not a, a matter of inability or intellect. It's about enthusiasm or the lack thereof. The problem isn't of the mind. It's of motivation. And at the end of the day, it's a moral problem. The Hebrews don't understand because they don't want to put the work in. Now, as a father of school-aged children, and as one who has been in the same boat years ago, I know the feeling. I know the feeling when one of my children is, is working on homework, encounters a particular math problem and says, I don't know the answer. So I go to the desk to look at the problem, 
Then I look at the problems they did just before it, and then I think to myself, this problem isn't that hard. There's maybe a little twist to it, but it's really not that hard. And in that moment, I make the assessment that my child is not lacking intellect. He or she is lacking motivation. The child doesn't want to put in the work to arrive to the answer. And I'll tell you what, I, I think my kids will agree. If you ask them, you may even get them to admit it. It's a lethargy issue, not an intellectual issue. And for some things that require more effort, we human beings can become lazy. In a similar but far more serious level, the Hebrews are called dull of hearing. And what that means is they are lethargic in their desire to know God and to know his word. And his diagnosis of them is that they are immature. And in order to highlight this point, he compares these readers to children. Look there in the text, verse 12 and following. He says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. At this point in their faith, the Hebrews should be able to teach what they've learned and received. And when the author says they ought to be teachers, he's not saying you have to sign up to be a Sunday school teacher or, or even a pastor where you're, teaching, where you're teaching deep theology and in robust doctrine. Not that at all. What he is saying is, you're not mature enough to explain to others what has been passed down to you. You can't share with others the, the gospel ABCs. You require someone to teach you the basics again. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. We need to go back to the basics frequently and, and often. Sometimes we neglect the, base, the basics to our detriment and to our harm. But that's not what he's addressing here. His concern is for their spiritual maturity. And like young children, they still need milk. We all know that children, babies in particular, need spiritual milk. But when they grow up, their diet no longer consists of milk. You know, in our household, we still have one child nursing at home. I mentioned already he's just over a year old. Don't know exactly when he'll be weaned. I think these days pediatricians tell moms to nurse uh, their children as long as two years. And Natalie has mentioned she probably won't do that. Well, think with me for a second. Can you imagine if an eight-year-old is still nursing? Actually, our family, a family friend of ours, has a friend who did this for her eight-year-old. And when she told Natalie, Natalie didn't really know what to say. It's an abnormal, you may say even bizarre picture to have in your mind, isn't it? Well, take it a step back further. Can an adult man or an adult woman be nursing from his or her mother's breast? Yuck. No words to describe how awkward that is. Essentially, that's what the, the Hebrews author charges his audience Namely, remaining in a perpetual babyish state. Adults can't be nursing at their mommy's breast. They need solid food. They need meals. They need a varied assortment of substance to fill their bellies in order to grow and remain strong and healthy. It's the same on the spiritual front. These Hebrews could not handle the meat because they were still relying on the milk. And their dependence on the milk endangered them from falling away. And the author utilizes the metaphor of, of eating milk and, and solid food for the word of God. In verse 13, again, he says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. And that phrase, the, the word of righteousness, refers to, to teaching springing from Christ on, on how to, to believe and live righteously. They haven't grown in it. And for the author of Hebrews to remain in spiritual infancy is, is not an option. The Christian life does not offer an option for spiritual stagnancy. You're either moving forwards or you're backtracking. There is no neutral. Some might even say being stagnant is moving backwards 
Whatever the case may be, the author says, you are immature, you are not where you should be. He was ready to serve them the meal they were, should be able to eat by now, but they weren't ready. I can almost hear him saying, you know, I'm ready to give you the, the good stuff, a, a full course meal, Caesar salad, filet mignon, seared bass. I'm ready to serve it up. How come you're not ready to eat? And as I mentioned earlier, this is not a message that's, again, easy on the ears. Who likes to be told that they're immature and, and childish? But that's what they needed. And by the providential wisdom of God, it's also what we need. Sometimes we need an extra pair of eyes to help us see what we can't see. We need someone to tell us how childish we're being. Since we're not quick to self-diagnose, we need others to help us. And the Christian life is a life of ever-increasing knowledge. One writer puts it this way, What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us. If we're not growing in our understanding of the infinite God, then we are in danger of falling away from the infinite God. Do you remember the greatest command from the mouth of Jesus when he was asked what the command was? Matthew 22, verse 37 and 38 Jesus' reply to that question was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and, and first commandment, he says. We love God by thinking grand and true thoughts about him with the mind that he's given us. How would you diagnose spiritual immaturity or spiritual maturity, I should say? As we'll look at in just a moment, spiritual maturity is not solely based on our store-up of knowledge and what we know about God. The most mature people are not those who possess and exercise the most deepest level of theology. Knowledge is not everything, but it's also not nothing. God never intended for us to be knowledgeable about him for individual pride's sake. However, We can't lay any claim to Christian maturity unless we have an increasing depth and breadth in the knowledge of God. Do you know more about God's character based on your study of his word, both individual and communal, than you did five years ago? What about 10 years ago if you've been a Christian for that long? On this subject, in my estimation, there are two indispensable means for growth in the life of a Christian. One is the local church, A pastor named Michael Foster writes, quote, nothing grows a Christian like a serious commitment to a single church week in and week out for years and years. Not conferences, not social media, not even personal devotions. The local church is where Christians are slowly forged in the fires of mundane faithfulness, end quote. Personally, I agree with this assessment, but I would probably challenge the the personal devotions part If personal devotions includes consistent Bible intake and prayer, those have to be included. Therefore, two indispensable factors for Christian maturation is, number one, strong investment in the local church, and number two, consistent pursuit of the Lord through Bible intake and prayer. And if you're committed to these two things, there's very little chance that you remain on a milk diet. And those who are not on a milk diet should be able to teach others the basics, right? Let me pose a question to you. It's not a question to make you feel guilty if you don't know the answer or don't have a confident answer. It's simply a way of exhorting you towards growth. If someone came to you and said, what do I need to do to become a Christian? What would you say? You get a softball served up on a silver platter. Tell me, what is Christianity about? What is it about, friend? Tell me how my life will change if I become a Christian. What would you say to your friend? Or what if a a coworker asked you, what's the difference between the God of Christianity and the God of Islam, Allah? They're the same, right? What would you say? What would you say? Here's another one. How can we be sure the Bible is true? Is it only because God says it is? Now, whether or not you feel ready or equipped to answer these questions, 
I'm just trying to help you examine where you are in the faith. And even if this is not a challenge for you, it's good for us to take an inventory of what we know and should be able to explain to others both inside and outside of the church. Diagnosis is important. And before we move on to the author's directive, consider a few questions for yourself to serve the purpose of diagnosis. What are the excuses? What are the reasons or excuses that you give for the lack of growth and or knowledge in your Christian walk? And what is, going to take, what is it going to take for you to, to rid yourself of those excuses? Another one is, is there someone who you can meet up with regularly to help you grow spiritually? What are the things you can do with that person to grow? And also lastly, how can the church, the congregation, the pastor help you to grow in biblical literacy and spiritual discernment? Parentheses, I, the pastor, I am open to hearing your suggestions. That is to say, the, the author of Hebrews isn't just concerned about diagnosis, or, or excuse me, we should be concerned about diagnosis, but he's not just content to land there and tell them what's wrong. He's also ready to help. And so moving from diagnosis, he also provides directive. He provides directive to solve the problem. And this is where we come to our second header in this morning's sermon. His directive is both explicit and implicit. Let us look at the directive explicit. If his diagnosis is that the Hebrews are too childish, he explicitly says, move on from the fundamentals. Master the fundamentals and then build off of that to move forward. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Now, I've kind of already alluded to this, but let me, let me reiterate. An unchanging reality within the Christian faith is that we will never graduate from the gospel. We will never stop needing to remind ourselves of the gospel. And that is, that is why we, we should be singing it and preaching it and, and talking about it all the time. And that is the, namely the gospel, that, it, that we receive the forgiveness of God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We can't earn our salvation. We can't work our way to heaven. Repentance from sin and, and faith in the perfect, crucified, and resurrected Savior is something that we'll never leave behind. However, what helps us to keep the faith is to stay grounded in, in these things while also learning new things. Some argue that studying doctrine only has negative results. They say it either divides Christians or it makes them prideful, it puffs them up, or both. And while these things can be true, what people fail to note is that everyone holds to a set of doctrines, even if you don't consciously think about it. Is it better to unite over some ambiguity of who God is and how he acts in this world? Is it better to say that we're focusing on other non-doctrinal issues within the Christian faith when we're actually just living out our theology? No. As R.C. Sproul says, everyone is a theologian. And how we practice our faith is based on what we think about God and ourselves in relation to his word. All that to say, if we're going to cling to Jesus, we must care about what he cares about. We must care about his word and what he has spoken in it. And this, this whole word, this Bible, these scriptures is what Jesus cares about. It, in fact, matters what you think about predestination. It matters what you think about free will. It matters whether or not you think the pastorate should be filled by sisters or it's an office that only Christian brothers can fill. It matters, what, it matters whether or not you think infants should be sprinkled or if the baptismal water should be reserved for believers who are actively trusting in Jesus. But I probably don't have to tell you that to, to most of you since the name of this church is Chinese Baptist church. But here's the point. Caring about these theological issues helps us to mature in Christ. And from a doctrinal standpoint, what sort of doctrines were the Hebrews learning? Then, then forgetting, then relearning. Well, the author tells us in the second half of verse 1, he says, look with me, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, 
and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. He offers us three different couplets, couplets having two kind of ideas in them. He offers three different couplets that aren't crystal clear for the Hebrews. First couplet, a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Probably refers to how people become Christians, that is through repentance and faith. These are important to the Christian body of doctrine. But what if it was the subject of every Sunday school lesson, Sunday in, Sunday out? No room for growth. Second couplet, instruction about washings, the laying on of hands. This one's a little harder to figure out what the author was referring to. Does it refer to ceremonial cleansings like in the Jewish law, or is it speaking of baptism? And, on the, and, and the, the laying on of hands, the diversity of purposes for laying on hands is, is vast in both the Old Testament and New Testament. It's hard to know which one it is. Third and final couplet, the, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. This last one looks to a, a future day of salvation and judgment. God's elect will experience a physical resurrection unto life, and those who reject Christ will be judged eternally for their sins. And fundamental to Christian theology, these are. For all three of these couplets, the point is the Hebrews need to move on from them. To stay on these matters forever reveals the infancy of these believers. Again, the bottom line, Christians must put effort into their growth. We cannot expect to grow passively. I ask you, what area of biblical study can you actively grow in? I've mentioned a few areas already. The Hebrews needed to grow in their understanding of the significance of the priesthood, including the Melchizedekian priesthood, of which we'll get to, Lord willing, in a few weeks. Personally, I'd like to grow in my understanding of the end times and how that affects how we live presently. I'd also like to grow in my understanding of how the word of God is applied through counseling. I'd like to grow in my understanding of the, the, Trinity, the Trinity. What about you? And so this is the explicit directive. Grow up and progress from the fundamentals. Well, the implicit directive is this. Grow in practice and meditation of the word. Look at verse 14. Excuse me, look at, uh, yes, verse 14 of chapter 5. But f- solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The fact of the matter is, you can grow in biblical knowledge as much as you want, as much as a professional theologian but still be as immature as a baby. Head knowledge must lead to practice. You can only live out the word of God if you take time to mull and meditate on it. And the idea here is that a mature Christian, as he consumes solid food, is able to know the difference between good and evil. He's been fed enough to know how to apply the word of God in his life. You can't apply the word of God, if you haven't thought about it actively and intentionally. And furthermore, you can't grow if you don't apply what you're hearing. Sometimes we make excuses for the pace of our spiritual growth or the lack thereof. I'm not growing because the the church lacks a program for small groups or discipleship. I'm not growing because my Christian friends haven't inspired me to, to know God better. I'm not growing because this sin issue I've been dealing with is something that I always have and always will be dealing with. I'm not growing because I haven't made strides in the past, so it's, it's okay if I slow up a, a bit now. Both subtle and obvious, we make excuses for reasons we lack growth. And sometimes they can be paired with circumstantial factors, but more often more often than we like to admit is because we simply don't like what the scripture teaches us. Therefore, we don't want to obey. We've been sipping the the Kool-Aid of worldly philosophies and it's affected us more than we even know. And like a fish swimming in its natural habitat, we don't even know we're in water. It's just how things are. We've become desensitized to the world and its, its lies. Obedience is only possible if we're giving ourselves the opportunity to grow. 
by exposing our hearts and minds to hearty food. Then we will be able to discern between good and evil. Are you willing to put the hard work in? The hard work that requires intense discipline and and training. It's those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice, the text says, who will be growing. And the words for trained and constant practice allude to incessant work, nonstop labor in order to improve. And in between my freshman and sophomore year of high school, my basketball coach, Randy Matheny, tried to drill into my head that I needed to get better at the point guard position. If you don't know what the point guard position is, that's the position that dribbles the ball up to the court and, and begins running the offense. And he told me, Chung! Yes, I, I got that, that last name address. Wherever you go, you should be dribbling the ball. Dribble that ball to the store. Dribble that ball when you're walking on the sidewalk. Dribble, 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 dribble all over the place, Chung. His raspy voice was that, really like that. Practice, practice, practice. And yes, despite what Alan Iverson says, practice matters. The same goes for maturity. The ability to discern good and evil only comes by way of training and practice. And Christian maturity comes by way of what the Puritans called holy sweat, meditating on and obeying the word of God. And the the spiritual reps enable you to grow healthier, stronger, and healthier and stronger spiritually. But lastly, we must entrust our growth to the Lord. At the end of the day, it is not up to us. Look at what verse 3 says. And this we will do if God permits. You can exert as much holy sweat as you can, but if God doesn't give the growth, then all of it will be in vain. God must grant the maturity. We don't have ultimate control in of ourselves internally of maturing into a steak-eating disciple of Christ. Verse 3 is the author's reminder that we are powerless and God is powerful. He wants the Hebrews to remain dependent on the living God. He wants us to persist in prayer to ask him for the growth. I guess the question is, are we to exert significant spiritual energy into growing or is God the one who raises us up? The answer is yes. Yes, not one or the other. It's, it's yes, both. That's the biblical teaching. I'm reminded of Paul's words to the Philippians in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So he's telling them, work it out. But then he says in verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We work and God works. But our work doesn't matter unless God works. So be comforted, brothers and sisters, that it's ultimately, it's not up to you. And it is his will. His will is your sanctification, your holiness. He has said so in his word. Therefore, when's the last time you specifically and intentionally prayed for your own spiritual growth. All sorts of times we pray for others so often, all the while forgetting to pray that God would grow us. And this we will do if he permits. Thus allow me to leave you with this challenge today. I suspect if I were to survey everyone in this room who professes Christ, Some may say autopilot is your default mode. Going through the motions is what's easy for you. I know because it's easy for me too. But the problem is going through autopilot is what keeps a Christian immature. So what is one area of growth in your life you can intentionally commit to the Lord today? What's one area that you can purposefully, intentionally commit to the Lord today? Well, go home, pray about it, and think about it, and don't just leave it out there. Then tell someone who can keep you accountable, preferably in this church. Then formulate a a plan of growth and continue to seek the Lord. Milk or steak? 
What's it going to be? Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would be challenged this day to know you more deeply and more intimately. Father, I pray against knowledge for knowledge's sake, to be puffed up and prideful, but I pray for knowledge that would help us become adults in the faith, mature in the faith, and not like children who depend on milk. And Father, ultimately we lift it up into your hands, even as the author of Hebrews says, and this we will do if God permits. So we pray that you would do this in our lives, not for our own glory, but for yours. And that in the coming days, we would see disciples who, are, who know you intimately and, and deeply and are following faithfully after you, practicing uh, what they've learned. Father, we also just pray that you would continue to use the resources of this church that you have uh, set aside, that we'd be faithful stewards of the finances, of our personal finances and corporate finances. Father, as we give and worship, I pray that you would use these offerings as our worship unto you and be pleased with them, and that you would use the resources for the making of disciples and the edification of the saints and the spreading of the gospel here at CBCOC and in Orange County and beyond. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the opportunity to worship you amongst one another. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.